we welcome along to the second part in our presentation of Mystery of the Lost Ark. I hope you enjoyed the previous presentation, part one, and it challenged your thinking. Harley Southwell is looking forward to bringing you the second chapter in this mystery this evening. It has been great to receive your comments and questions in the chat boxes each evening. Please continue to post these at the end of the program and Harley will enjoy to answer these for you in the Q&A presentation times. To find out more about when these are on, be sure to subscribe to the YouTube channel or like the Facebook page and the times will be posted each week for you to join in. Our next program will be on Friday night and it is the topic, Who is the Antichrist? This is one of our most anticipated topics of the whole series, so make sure you don't miss it. I hand it over to Harley now and we hope you enjoy the program. Welcome back to The Prophetic Code, everyone. Glad you're able to join us and it's been a pleasure being able to present to you so far. Tonight's presentation, Mystery of the Lost Ark, Part 2. Very excited about this one, so let's begin with a prayer and let's go. Dear Heavenly Father, please be with us now as we unravel the Mystery of the Lost Ark, Part 2 and journey into uh, understanding better the concepts uh, that you have for us to understand in the Prophetic Code. We ask in Jesus' name, Amen. Each of these presentations, I hope you're noticing by now, builds upon the one that came before. In fact, each one lays a foundation for helping understand the topic that comes next. Uh, and we always leave you with a bit of a cliffhanger at the end as well to bring you in for the next one. But that's important because each one, as I said, builds on the next. What we're looking at tonight builds on what we looked at, of course, in the last presentation on Mystery of the Lost Ark uh, Part 1, where we looked at the treasure of the lost uh, of the Ark of the Covenant and especially the treasure that contained in it of the Ten Commandments. Now we're going to hone in a little bit closer and focus even more clearly on something else that, was l that has been lost to history in regards to this idea of the Ark. Uh, and this is going to build on for our next two presentations, which are Antichrist Part 1 and Part 2, and also down the line for when we look at the Mark of the Beast. So make sure, uh, I'm glad you joined us, and just a bit of a, this is just a bit of background for where we're going in the future. But before I want to do that, I want to talk about this idea of where we are as a world right now with this issue of stress. It just seems that everything is so fast-paced at the moment, that we're just going from one thing to the other. Even though we have an abundance of leisure activities and things that we can do, the world is changing so fast, politically, socially, in so many different ways, in so many different areas, it just seems that uh, it just compounds to the stress that we are developing. House affordability uh, is decreasing and personal debt levels are increasing. Uh, people are overworking to cope as a result. Uh, the accountancy firm Grant Thornton reported that stress levels have increased after they interviewed a bunch of business leaders. Stress levels in the last 12 months have increased 50%, uh, with the highest levels being recorded in Southeast Asia. Countries such as Australia, New Zealand, and the United States, with rates of 48%, 46%, and 45%, respectively, of increasing stress levels, are all, rec are all uh, being affected by this. And I think you can relate. You know, if you're a, uh, if you're a busy mom, you know, you, you kind of rush throughout your, you, you, you rush through your job, and you come home, and then you do a, a second shift taking care of the kids. And it's just like, man, when, when does this stop? You know, whenever we think about our last week, we go, man, that week was just too busy. Uh, quality time and sleep is disappearing as well because we have the, with the advent of the smartphone, it's taken away our circadian rhythm with the lights being flashed in our eyes, which meaning we're not getting as much rest at night as we should. Uh, and get this, this st statistic staggered me when I first came across it. Uh, a Cornell University study revealed that every uh, that the average American father only spends 38 seconds of quality time with their child every day. Just 38 seconds. Because they're just so busy and they can't really do anything else. Do you feel like you have the Atlas Syndrome? Feeling like you're carrying the weight of the world on your shoulders? As people are looking for answers to this problem of stress, Secularly, there's a bunch of different options that are, that are popping up. You know, we're getting, you know, an increase in apps to help you listen to you know, certain music or meditation apps and so forth. Uh, Harriet Myers, the president of the employer consulting group, The Confidence Center, has actually suggested a number of novel ways for helping deal with stress. She says, you know, uh, plant a tree, feed some birds, uh, dance to a jig, tickle a baby, don't wear tight clothes. These are all things that she says 
help us reduce stress. But I want to look at what Jesus says helps us reduce stress. Matthew eleven twenty eight says, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. You see, if you would like some rest for your body, mind, and soul, then Jesus invites you to come to him. He has already paved the way for your salvation. He has your life in his hands. And he says, I've got it taken care of. I've come to give you life and to give it abundantly. And he wants to take life's burdens off of your shoulders and spend time with you, growing that relationship together. Time away from the frenetic pace of life. Now, that being said, looking back at the Ark of the Covenant, the Ark of the Covenant was housed in the tabernacle or the temple in the nation of Israel. Now, it's interesting to think the nation of Israel is called the Holy Land. Now, in this Holy Land, you had the Holy Ground, which was the area where the Ark of, uh, where, where the temple was, was kept. And then in the Holy Ground, you had the Holy Place, which was the first apartment of this temple or sa sa um, sanctuary. And then you had the Most Holy Place. So you've gone from Holy Land to Holy Ground to Holy Place to Most Holy Place. And inside that Most Holy Place, there was the Ark of the Covenant. And inside the Ark of the Covenant, as we discussed last week, was the Ten Commandments. So we're just zooming in, one centering in, centering in, centering in. What was the center of the Ten Commandments? Well, at the center of the Ten Commandments, we find God's solution to overwork and overstress. It says here in Exodus 20, 8 to 10, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work. You, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. What's very interesting about this is that we see here at the heart of the Ten Commandments, God placing his, uh, his commandment about the seventh, remembering to rest on the seventh day every week. And in doing this, you were not to work yourself and you weren't to make anyone else work for you. Of all the things God wanted his people to do, this is an interesting one. Because he says in his, in his list of Ten Commandments, along with stuff like don't kill, don't cheat, don't steal, honor your parents, don't take God's name in vain, put me first. He says also, remember to rest on the seventh day. It was his, one of his top ten priorities for having a loving relationship with him. Now, this idea of remember is quite interesting because the Sabbath commandment we often, we, we kind of feel is the only one which we know begins with the word remember, but the tragic fact is everyone seems to have forgotten it. A British survey, over a thousand people were interviewed discussing the relevance of the Ten Commandments. And one of the, one of the questions they asked was for people to remember as many of the Ten Commandments from the top of their head as they could. And you know, a few people were remember, able to remember, oh, you know, you shall not kill, you shall not steal, you shall not uh, commit adultery. Those are the three most common ones. But only 4% of all people, of a thousand people, remembered the Sabbath day commandment. And most people had never even heard of it. Which is very interesting. It tells me the devil's done a very good job of erasing this important aspect of the Ten Commandments out of the human, uh, human society because we just don't remember it. And that, you would think, would be what the devil would want. Uh, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. The one thing that we seem to have forgotten. Well, where does this idea of remembering the Sabbath day come from? Well, let's look at Genesis 2, 2 and 3. God finishes creation on you know day 1, day 2, day 3, day 4, day 5, day 6, so on and so forth. And then it says, On the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had done. And God blessed the Sabbath day. Uh, yeah, and God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because in it he had rested from all his work which God had created and made. So what's interesting is when you think about it, we know where years uh, come from. They go come from the cycle of the earth going around the, the sun. When we do that in 365 days, we say, hey, it's a new year. We measure months by the cycle of the moon. And we measure days by the rotation of the earth. These are all things that are we, we use from the heavenly bodies to be able to recognize and keep track of certain time scales for ourselves. But where did the concept of the week come from? Why is it that human society all seems to have this concept of a week when there is no astronomical 
sequencing to be able to give us this cultural phenomena. It is because at the beginning, when God created the world, he created this weak system. And so we have one six days, and then the seventh day was the day of rest. See, there was a day of rest established by God at the origin of the world. Now, we have to ask, you know, it says that God was tired, uh, God, God, God rested, but does that mean that God was tired? No, the Bible says God never gets tired. He never grows faint. He never grows weary. So why did God rest? Well, it was to spend time with his creations. The word rest in the, in the Genesis story is translated from the Hebrew word Shabbat or Sabbath. Uh, when the Bible says that God rested on the seventh day, it literally means that he Sabbathed. He also blessed this seventh day. And to bless simply means to make happy. The Sabbath is not a boring day of restrictions, as some people think it is. It was actually blessed by God to be the happiest day of the week. You know, and then it also says not only did he bless it, but he sanctified it. To sanctify means to set apart for holiness. God blessed the seventh day and he made it holy. So it's important to note as well that God blessed and sanctified the seventh day. Not the first, not the third, not the fifth, but the seventh day. As a result, no matter how sincerely anyone else, you know, like our, our, our Muslim brothers and sisters, uh, they, they rest on Friday, uh, so on and so forth. If you choose another day, that's not the day that God has blessed. That's not the day that, day that God has sanctified. He only chose one of them. So no matter how sincerely uh, you may try and keep that day holy, it will never be God's actual Sabbath. Deuteronomy 5.15 says this, And remember that you are a slave in the land of Egypt, and that the Lord your God brought you out from there by a mighty hand and by an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. Now, in the first iteration of the, of the Ten Commandments, found in Exodus 20, God says, the reason why I want you to keep the Sabbath day is because I created the world in six days and I rested on the seventh. But the reason he gives in the second iteration of the Ten Commandments, given, on, uh, given in, in Deuteronomy 5, he says, the reason I want you to keep the Sabbath is because I have res rescued you and redeemed you from slavery. From slavery. And so, in a sense, the seventh day, God has created to be a memorial of two specific things. Creation and redemption. Creation and redemption. If we keep the Bible Sabbath, you are signifying that you actually are believing that God is your creator and redeemer. Uh, in fact, I put down four points that keeping the Sabbath as God commanded it actually shows in your response to God. Number one, it's that it shows that you believe and trust in God as your creator. Number two, you believe in salvation through Christ, not works. As I remember, the, sa the Sabbath was given to show that we, to be a reminder that God is the only one who saves us, not we ourselves. Not we ourselves at all. Not only that, it shows that you have a living relationship with God. In order to have a living relationship with anyone, you need to be able to spend time with them. And the Sabbath is a time when we do this. Obviously, we spend time with God every day. But God has given one special day where he specifically wants us to spend time with him. And it shows, finally, that you are loyal to God. Now, in the prophetic code of Scripture, the Sabbath actually holds a very significant uh, theme uh, and, and symbol, which is why I'm actually talking about it tonight. Uh, Ezekiel 20, verse 12 says, Moreover, I also gave them my Sabbaths to be a sign. A sign means like a symbol or so forth. A sign between them and me that they might know that I am the Lord who sanctifies them. So the Sabbath is given to be a sign that God is the one who sanctifies. Uh, it's, it's, it's a sign of righteousness by faith, of righteousness not of our own works, but of what God has done and does do in and through us. Now, some people say, though, okay, that's, that's well and good, but Harley, the Sabbath is a Jewish concept. Uh, it's not actually meant to be for uh, us Gentiles or us non-Jewish people to keep, in which I would say, have we look at Mark 2.27. It's a good point, but Mark 2.27 says this, And he said to them, that's Jesus, The Sabbath was made for man, and not man for the Sabbath. 
In Isaiah 56 verse 5, it also says this. This is a prophecy in Isaiah 56 5, speaking about what God's people are going to look like in the future. And it says also, the sons of the foreigner, in other words, non-Jewish people, who join themselves to the Lord to serve him and to love the name of the Lord, to be his servants, everyone who keeps from defiling the Sabbath and holds fast to my covenant. In other words, these sons of the foreigners, the, the, the strangers, the Gentiles who join in the worship of the true God and love him, that's the key idea of loving him, they're going to want to keep the Sabbath as well because it's all about spending time with the one you love. The Sabbath was not made to remind us of our creator. The Sabbath was made to remind us of our creator God, a God who created everyone. Australians, Chinese, Africans, Americans, Jews, everyone everyone together and it is a day for all humanity it shows here the sabbath was created a thousand the sabbath was created thousands of years before any jews even existed uh, and it's called the sabbath of the lord your god not the sabbath of the jews in exodus 20 verse 10 it's not just the jewish sabbath it's god's sabbath the sabbath is made for man mankind to, so that we can have an intimate relationship with our father the question then comes, okay, well, Harley, that's that's interesting. That's good to know. Um, but what exactly is, which day of the week is the Sabbath? Well, we can have a quick look uh, at some chronology, and we find it in Luke 23 uh, and also in Luke 24. First of all, it's speaking about the death of Jesus. It says, this man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. That day was the preparation, and the Sabbath drew near. So there was a day called the preparation, which was then going to be followed by the Sabbath. Then it says, then they returned and prepared spices and fragrant oils, and they were going to put that into the tomb, but they rested on a Sabbath day according to the commandment. So they're ready to go, but then they the Sabbath comes, so they rest according to the commandment. Now on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they and certain other women with them came to the tomb, bringing the spices which they had prepared, but they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. I love that last that last part of the verse, we're specifically looking at the chronology of when the Sabbath is, but don't miss the fact that the, they found an empty tomb. That's because Jesus Christ is risen. But here's the thing. The Bible is clear which day is the Sabbath. It's the day that comes before the first day of the week. So there is a preparation day, then there's a Sabbath day, and then there's the first day of the week. In other words, it would be, in, what, in our culture, Saturday is the Sabbath day. The seventh day of the Bible of the Bible is thus Saturday. See, notice the women kept the Sabbath according to the commandment. And this gospel was written nearly 30 years after the resurrection. If there had been a change in the day of worship, then this would have been an ideal time for Luke to record it. Instead, he simply confirms the seventh day as the Sabbath commandment. Now check this out as well. Almost, so many languages still carry this idea of the seventh day as what we call Saturday, uh, in, in, in our Australian culture, in, in, in a culture which I'm speaking in. We call it Saturday, but so many other languages call it some form of the word Sabbath, this seventh day of the week. From Arabic to Croatian to Bulgarian to Polish to Romanian to Russian to Somali and Sudanese, all these different languages all carry with it when they speak of the seventh day of the week, they literally refer to it as the Sabbath day, the day of rest. Uh, now, the other thing that people ask is, wait a second, how can we know that the Saturday we now keep and the cycle that we now keep is the same, uh, same, same weekly cycle as the Jews kept, as Jesus would have kept? It's been 2,000 years. Perhaps we missed a week somewhere along the line. When I say, okay, that would require, first of all, the entire culture of the Jewish nation to miss a whole day together. All you have to do is go back and ask the Jews who've been keeping the Sabbath for 4,000 years. Thousands of thousand years they've been, they've been keeping this cycle and they haven't lost it. Uh, any uh, study into an encyclopedia or dictionary will show that the Sabbath is on Saturday. So religious leaders from all different uh, groups have also said this. Check this out. Um, from a Catholicism for Dummies, written by two Catholic reverends. Uh, so basically, Saturday is the Sabbath day. It's the last day of the week, the seventh day, the day on which God rested after six days of creation. Even modern calendars have Saturday as the last day of the week and Sunday as the first day of the new week. Uh, we see here from uh, Anglican uh, Manual of Christian Doctrine, 
is there any commandment in the New Testament to change the day of weekly rest from Saturday to Sunday? They say, no, there isn't. Nowhere in the New Testament do you find that command. And then from the, uh, th from the author of the Baptist Manual, there was and is a commandment to keep holy the Sabbath day, but the Sabbath day was not Sunday. It will be said, however, and with some show of triumph, that the Sabbath was transferred from the seventh to the first day of the week. Where can the record of such transaction be found? Not in the New Testament? Absolutely not. There is no scriptural evidence of the change of the Sabbath institution from the seventh to the first day of the week. Um, now, we're going to ask this question, well, how come then, if everyone says very clearly that the uh, the seventh day is Saturday, where now most all Christians recognize their Sabbath as being the Lord's Day, which they call Sunday, the first day of the week. But before we do that, I want us to quickly notice what did what do we find the example of Jesus and the apostles in the early church in regards to the Sabbath? And then we'll talk about the history of how this has changed around and why everyone has forgotten the one commandment that God said to remember. In Luke 4, verse 16, it says, So he came up to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, that's Jesus once again, and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and he stood up to read. So Jesus, it was his custom on the Sabbath day to go to the synagogue, which is the equivalent of church, you might say. So when Jesus was here on earth, he was in the custom or habit of Sabbath observance and attended a worship service on that day. The Bible tells us that Jesus is our example in all things, particularly in relation to obedience to the commandments in 1 Peter 2, 21 and 22. So we see here if Jesus is going and keeping the Sabbath, as his custom was, we should uh, be very much considering that as well. Matthew 24, verse 20 says, this is Jesus prophesying about uh, the signs of the times. And he says, look, when you see these things, you got to run. But then he says, pray that your flight, in other words, your you're running away, that's not your the flight that you've booked, pray that your flight may not be on the winter or on the Sabbath. Now he's speaking specifically of when Jerusalem was going to be surrounded by the Roman armies. And he said, you will have a chance to escape. And when you have this chance to escape, pray that it's not on the winter or on the Sabbath. Now this event happened 30 years in AD 70, 30 years after Jesus spoke this. In other words, he was expecting his followers still to be keeping the Sabbath if he was telling them, hey, hope that your flight isn't on the Sabbath day. Um, and so, yeah, we see here once again that Jesus is, 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 is keeping in mind that he, he has no indication or no um, command anywhere that, hey, look, now we're going to change the day that we keep holy. Uh, what about the Apostle Paul? Let's look at Acts chapter 13, verses 42 and 44. Uh, it says here, this is speaking in the early church context. So when the Jews went out of the synagogue, the Gentiles begged that these words might be preached unto them the next Sabbath. So Paul's in the city and he goes into the synagogue to uh, talk to the uh, Jewish you know, people there, you know, because he would often start with the Jews because they're the ones who knew the scriptures already. And he would show them the prophecies being fulfilled in Christ, the Messiah code being revealed throughout Scripture, and he would reason with them and present with them the truth. And he would do this on the Sabbath when all the Jews would gather at the synagogue. Uh, and then as he's doing this, there's a bunch of Gentiles hanging around, and they say, hey, we really liked what we heard. Can you present it to us next Sabbath? Now, Paul didn't say, oh, just come tomorrow. That's my actual Sabbath. No, let's read on. Now, when the congregation had broken up, many of the Jews and devout proselytes, that's um, people who've been converted, followed Paul and Barnabas, who, speaking to them, persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. And then it says, On the next Sabbath, almost the whole city came together to hear the word of God. So Paul was a Sabbath keeper, very clearly from this passage. In fact, you find it throughout in Acts 17, verse 2, and Acts 18, verse 4, indication that Paul kept the Sabbath. He, along with the other apostles, worshipped on the Sabbath with both Jews and with Gentiles. He didn't say it was one day for the Jews and another day for the Gentiles. No, it was one day for both. If there was a synagogue in town, Paul would meet by the... If there, sorry, if there wasn't a synagogue in town, Paul would meet by the riverside with the Gentiles. And here he would pray and share the scriptures on the Sabbath day. And you find that in Acts 16, verse 13. So the Sabbath was certainly the day of the worship for the early church. 
Isaiah 58, 13 and 14 says, If you turn away your foot from the Sabbath, from doing your pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy day of the Lord, honorable and shall honor him, not doing your own ways, nor finding your own pleasure, nor speaking your own words, then you will delight yourself in the Lord, and I will cause you to ride on the high hills of the earth. What a wonderful promise. God tells us that if we stop neglecting and trampling all over the Sabbath, then He will lift us into a beautiful experience of joy and fulfillment. It will feel as if, feel as if we're flying high, riding on the high hills of the earth. So the Sabbath day is a delight, a, a, a day where we can forget about the stresses of life and focus on spending quality, quality time with Jesus and helping other people, just like Jesus did Himself. And not only this, so we see that Jesus kept the Sabbath, he believed that the early church was going to keep the Sabbath, and they did in the, with the example of Paul, and we find it all the way through the book of Acts. But we also find in the new earth this promise being given of the prophecy of the new earth. And it says, As for the new heavens and the new earth, which I will make, shall remain before me, and it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another and from one Sabbath to another, all flesh shall come to worship before me, says the Lord. So notice this, in the new heavens and in the new earth, it, it says that from one Sabbath to another and from one new moon to another, everyone will come to worship the Lord. And so God's people will continue worshipping on the Sabbath day in the new earth that's promised. In other words, the Sabbath was created before man sinned in Eden and it's going to be in the new Eden as well. As well. So, just some key points relating to the Sabbath just before we move on. The Sabbath was kept by our first parents. The Sabbath was confirmed at Sinai in the Ten Commandments. And the Sabbath was honored by God's people. The Sabbath was exalted by Jesus. The Sabbath was established in Christianity by the disciples. And the Sabbath will be kept in eternity in heaven. We have, in a sense here, this eternal law. You know, some people think that you know all the other commandments, the first three and the last six are all binding forever. But they say, oh, look, this, the, the, the seventh day Sabbath idea, that was only for the Jews. Even though everything else written on stone is permanent, that thing written on stone isn't. It's changeable. Whereas we see actually throughout history, throughout the story of the Bible, that it is very much set in stone just as much as the others are. Exodus 20 verse 8 shows us, says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. But some people ask, okay, what does keeping the Sabbath holy mean? Well, holiness is found in closeness to God. You cannot be close to God whilst doing your own work or your own amusement. You don't live for yourself in the presence of God. In fact, in the presence of God, you live with Him and for Him. That being said, in spending time with God, there is great joy to be found in this holiness. Sabbath keeping is only ever a drudgery for me, because personally I am a Sabbath keeper. It's only ever a drudgery for me if I want to act selfishly. If I want to do my own things, then I find the Sabbath to be a burden. But when I, in times where I'm like, yes, it's the Sabbath and I want to spend it with God, it's the greatest blessing. Uh, and so Jesus, you know, he gave us the true example of what it means to keep the Sabbath holy. Throughout his life, he went to worship God at his local synagogue or, you know, in, in, in our Christian context, the church. He spent time in nature with his disciples. He healed people of physical illness and he restored people to spiritual health. So these are all things that we can do if we want to also follow the example of Jesus in keeping the Sabbath. Now you might be thinking, well, you know, yeah, it sounds good, but everyone I know, everyone in my church, they go, they, they, they do Sunday Sabbath. They do Sunday day of rest. If I was to start keeping the Sabbath, it would be quite stressful and quite hard for me. And that is, I understand how confronting that may be. But let's quickly look as we finish up at Acts 5 verse 29. It says here in Acts 5 29, we ought to obey God rather than men. Some people say it doesn't really matter which day I keep just as long as it's one out of seven. Um, but what does the Bible really say? You know, the Bible says we cannot add to God's law and we cannot detract from God's law. We cannot change God's law. You know, in fact, when it, in, in regards to man-made 
holidays and festivals, for example, like Anzac Day, we can only celebrate Anzac Day on the day that commemorates the landing of the troops up at Gallipoli. We can only, you know, in, I'm, I'm half American, the other half of me is, is, is American, and so 4th of July. You can't celebrate the 4th of July on the 5th of July because it's literally, that's the day of independence. You know, your wedding anniversary is your wedding anniversary. It doesn't, that, that date doesn't change. Uh, and so those specific dates are very much key to remembering the event being commemorated. And so the Sabbath was put in place not by human government, but by the Lord God Almighty. Well, why do many churches then keep Sunday? Well, we have a bit of a, a history lesson right here from a, a, a source from the, well, the Converts Catechism of Catholic Doctrine. Um, it says this, which day is the Sabbath day? Uh, and, this, and this Catholic source says Saturday is the Sabbath day. Interesting coming from a Catholic source because Catholics, of course, keep the Lord's Day, which is Sunday. They call it the Lord's Day. Why do we observe Sunday instead of Saturday? They say this. We observe Sunday instead of Saturday because the Catholic Church in the Council of Laodicea in AD 336 transferred the sol solemnity from Saturday to Sunday. So what happened is a simple version of the history. Basically, human the, the, the early church had a lot of issues with the Jews and the Romans. They were kind of like straddling halfway in between. The Jews would persecute them for not being Jewish, and the Romans were persecuting them for not being pagan. Uh, and, 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 and they also had this, the, the Jews had this, you know, said that they worshipped the same God, uh, and they said, look, if you, if you want to be Christian, you know, but also Jew, you still have to, you have to be circumcised, you have to keep the Jewish feast days, and all these kind of things, which very clearly in the New Testament we don't need to do anymore. Uh, but they also were saying, you know, let's, let's you know, Saturday and, and Sunday. And in many areas, the Jews and Christians would be, be confused because they both were keeping the same day. And the Romans would be just like, oh, you guys are the same. But they're like, no, we're not. And so they would start celebrating and commemorating the first day of the week, the day when Jesus rose from the dead. And it was out of good intentions uh, because they're like, you know, this is the day that Jesus rose from the grave. And so we would like to, you know, commemorate that. And just to also, you know, sh it's, it's just a bit more convenient than doing the same thing as the Jews did. Uh, and so over time, though, it got to the point where the Jews and the Christians became more animos, a animus towards each other. And eventually, in AD 336, with, with the majority of Christians having slipped away and forgotten the, the fourth commandment and keeping the solemnity for the f that's reserved for the seventh day onto the first day of the week, the Catholic Church decided, hey, let's just do it and command it, transfer the solemnity from Saturday to Sunday. Let's change the law of God and do it that way. And so that's why, ever since that point, Sunday has been the Christian Sabbath, uh, which they have referred to as the Lord's Day, because they say, well, you know, this is, you know, it's not the Sabbath, it's the Lord's Day that we keep. But I ask you, which, which day did Jesus say that he was the Lord of? He said, the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. The Lord's Day is actually the Sabbath. Uh, and so when I sh showed up before, we ought to obey God rather than men. It shows why. There was a man's command which said, hey, let's transfer the solemnity from Saturday to Sunday. You won't find such a command anywhere in Scripture. Hebrews 4.4 4 says this, For he spoke in a certain place of the seventh day in this way, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And then looking down at verses 9 and 10, There remains therefore a rest for the people of God. For he who has entered into his rest has himself also ceased from his works, as God did from his. Satan hates the Sabbath because it is a memorial of salvation by grace through faith and not of works. If the church had remembered to keep the Sabbath, there would have never been such a falling away into works-based salvation, which we saw happen in the Middle Ages. Uh, but because we forgot, we started to rely on our own strength and our own power as human beings, and this whole you know, salvation by works issue came, became a big issue. But the New Testament clearly states that the Sabbath is a memorial of the fact that we just stop and we rest in the salvation that God has given us. It's a day where you stop working for yourself and you say, God, I'm handing my life over to you, not just spiritually, but also physically, financially, socially, in every aspect of my life. You are the one who leads and guides. And in the end time, as I shared last time, 
God says that at the end time, the dragon was enraged with the woman and he went to make war with the rest of her offspring who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. God's last day church will possess the beautiful harmony of obedience and faith in Jesus. Throughout the Bible, it has always been Jesus and the commandments that have been the foundation of the church. And those who are ready and waiting for him will be commandment keepers. Will be and, and, and not just nine of them, no, they will remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. And I believe that's why God has in these last days raised up a message of remember the Sabbath day because he knows that his people will want to commemorate the fact that their salvation is by grace through faith alone. Our key conclusions as we wrap up, Jesus invites you to come to him for complete peace and rest. God has set aside the seventh day of the week as a rest day. It's holy and blessed. God was the first Sabbath keeper in the Garden of Eden. The seventh day of the week is the Saturday Sabbath. The Sabbath was placed by God in the heart of the Ten Commandments. Jesus and the early Christian church kept the Sabbath, and the Sabbath was made for all people in every age. The Sabbath is a symbol of creation and salvation, gifts of grace from God. The Sabbath was never changed and will be kept in the new earth. God's last day church will be recognized as trusting in Jesus and being obedient to him in all aspects. When Jesus finished the work of creating the world, he rested on the Sabbath day. When Jesus finished the work of redeeming the world on the cross, he rested in the tomb on the Sabbath day. And so when I keep the Sabbath, it's a memorial of that for me. It helps me because I, I know you can't, you can't keep the first day of the week as a memorial of God finishing creation because that was just when he started it. And you can't keep the first uh, the, the, the Friday or you can't keep Sunday as a memorial of salvation because Jesus himself chose to rest and commemorate the Sabbath himself in his death and resurrection. Your response. I understand this may be something that some of you may be unsure about uh, because it's a new thing and you, and you may be thinking, well, to, to, to start keeping the Sabbath would be such a big thing because no one around me does it. But just remember, I have never met somebody, well, I, I can personally say I've never met somebody who's messed up their life by choosing to follow God's commandments. Do you desire to rest in God's creative power and strengthen your relationship with Him through regularly keeping the Sabbath holy? I want you to put that comment down there. If you feel the Holy Spirit saying, this is something new, I know it may be scary, but... Take that step of faith and choose to invite God's presence into your heart to give you the strength and power to remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. If you're still unsure though, and you would like more information or you have questions, please comment the questions. I, I didn't cover nearly all, the, uh, all of the particular answers and responses to this. Uh, if you're in the South Brisbane area where we're streaming from, I, we could possibly even meet with you and we can discuss this topic together. But comment your questions. I'll do it in the Q&A uh, if you have any. Um, and that, but though if you choose to keep the Sabbath, it is just the most incredible thing. I've been doing it for almost, yeah, for all my life. And uh, it has been truly one of the most special things for me. So I would like to seal this commitment uh, with a prayer. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we want to thank you so much for your great love for us. And we want to thank you for your love for us as shown in the Sabbath commandment. The one that's been forgotten by society, but you call us to remember. And you've raised up this message being presented at these last days because you know that you want to have people who are completely committed to you uh, at these end times. We thank you for hearing and being with us even though we're watching in our homes and different devices. We are united by your love. And we ask this prayer in the name of Jesus. Amen. Tonight's topic, who is the Antichrist? Who is the Antichrist? I know many of you are anticipating this topic because it's one of our most, uh, you know, there's so many theories, there's so many conspiracies, there's so many ideas. Well, we're not going to look at conspiracy theories. Well, we're going to look at a few. But just at the beginning, what we're going to focus on is what does the Bible say? We're going to focus on the prophetic codes revealed in Scripture, specifically in Daniel chapter 7, but a few other places where the Antichrist appears being prophesied about. Uh, we're going to start identifying some identifying marks of the Antichrist. Part 1, we're going to lay the foundation. And then in part 2, which you can really only watch if you've watched part 1, we will name names. Name names. Who is the Antichrist? The Bible is very clear. And I hope you'll be able to tune with in with us then next time. God be with you. 
and it's been a pleasure being able to speak to you tonight.